Welcome to the Xterra Podcast. The Xterra mission is to explore and discuss the business of space and its effect on the national and global economy, as well as life on Earth. How does what happens in space affect your life every day? That's what we're exploring on the Xterra website, as well as on this podcast. My guest on this edition of the podcast is Edgar Zapata, a retired NASA engineer who now writes a blog called Zapata Talks NASA. And Edgar, thank you for being our guest today. Thank you for having me. You're a retired NASA engineer, so tell us what you did at NASA. Oh, that's, uh, that could go on a little while, but um, I, I think that when I retired, people would have said I was, I was that operability guy or the ops guy or you know, the, the, the person representing that operations point of view at Kennedy or for Kennedy. Uh, but I, uh, I began with the space shuttle, just like most of my generation, after Challenger, big hiring spree. And I stayed there about 12 years, uh, system here, system there, external tank, uh, liquid oxygen, filling in here and there on odd shifts for other systems when uh, uh, when I could, I always thought that was a good opportunity to cross train and learn. And um, but uh, after 2000, I, I went over to what I uh, what I had started to get into, which was advanced projects, mm -hmm. and uh, went over to a systems engineering office. And from project to project, NASA's had a lot of advanced projects. Um, not all of them make it through that uh, that learning stage or that that technology development stage, but um, sometimes I guess I'd be accused of having been in every study with a ABC letter out there uh, for the last 20 years. So a NASA jack of all trades and a master of most, I suppose. I try. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. then how did, you, how did you get into the space business? Uh, so mechanical engineer uh, from uh, the University of Puerto Rico, yay. And um, I got hired straight out of college. Um, the, the advanced projects came because occasionally the, the, the projects about what comes after the shuttle would come around and they'd kind of be begging for who could tell us, you know, what's going on with the shuttle and what, what to do, you know, what to do right next time. And I guess I was, you know, everybody kind of stepped back some days and I, I, I didn't step back quickly enough. So it looked like I stepped forward. <laughs> and <laughs> you, you ask enough uh, of these, um, uh, you know, it's like they say, there are no stupid questions, but you, you ask a few like, why does that cost so much? And that's, that's how it's down a rabbit hole. And I guess I, I went all the way down that rabbit hole too, um, in many ways, so. So let's talk a little bit about then your current project, which is ZapataTalksNASA.com. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little oh. bit about it. Well, um, I, I, I don't think it's that untypical for people are in our industry. We have, we have something to say. We, we, we've gotten a lot of pieces of a puzzle. And mm -hmm. I, I find that writing helps to put the pieces together. Um, if, you can, if you can write it, Perhaps you've actually put a few little pieces of the puzzle together down at the corner and you can start working the border. Um, and after enough years, there's, well, there's a lot to say. I, so I thought I, it came naturally to me to, to start writing. And um, I think even before I retired, well, before I retired, some people said I, I could be a little prolific, which I don't, I don't think it was always a compliment. Uh, the, the, the hardest thing is to get something to be short and sweet. Mm -hmm. And to the point, that's that's difficult. You, I mean, and anybody can write a hundred pages, but um, the challenge is writing one page that that gets across a lot, right? And so, I I, I found myself with that challenge in in my retirement. As someone who has written for broadcast for many, many years, I know exactly what you're talking about. You mm -hmm. need to be short, concise, and and, uh, yes. and and get your point across. Are you sometimes critical of NASA in this blog, or is it um, is it more informational? What's kind of the trust to, of it? Yeah, I, I uh, admittedly yes, uh, but there's nothing wrong with being critical. Um, that can be positive too. You're you're mm -hmm. trying to take something apart 
understand it, right? But but it, it, there's an old saying: Can you explain it to just anybody? Like uh, I think a physicist once said, "Can if you can explain it to the bartender, right? Mm -hmm. Then you really understand something." And I, I think. I think I take on that challenge for myself in those those mental conversations. If if I if I can't get it down to the task bracks, then maybe I don't understand that. And and so writing is a is a very good forcing function. I'd I'd suggest it for anybody who is trying to figure out just what's going on and, and ask why a few times. Um, ask why five times, like they say, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you will you will try to figure something out and who knows you might. Now, you first came to our attention when you gave a presentation at the May 2021 Commercial Space Telcon, where you talked about US space competitiveness and you did an analysis of the falling launch costs of the last several decades. So how does that change the landscape for commercial space activities? Well, I think everything changed once the shuttle's days were, were numbered, right? So. Mm -hmm. Um, after the loss of Columbia, it was uh, decided, uh, the administration then, that uh, we would only finish the station and that was it. Um, and, and then something happened there, something very, um, very significant. I don't, think, I don't think perhaps it's appreciated just how different it was that NASA said, well, maybe we can go partner with the private sector and always have a couple of providers and we'll, we'll be more results oriented and it'll be firm fixed price. Um, and the partner will be expected to contribute mm -hmm. to the upfront development and to tell us about their business case for non-government business. This was all a, a sea change. And I, I have to admit, I didn't appreciate it at the time. I was over on the, I was over under the umbrella of the big program what today would be called SLS and Orion. Um, but as I started to see what was happening on the, on the other side, you still had to get cargo to the station. One day you would have to get crew to the station. I, I, I started to realize there's, there's something going on here, which is huge. It's, um, and then I put numbers to it. I, I, and that was a paper I put out in uh, 2017. Um, and when you, you know, it's sort of like the joke that you want to do the math. Yeah. And I, I did the math and it showed tremendous progress uh, for NASA and for the private sector. Along with the falling launch costs, how much did NASA's reliance on Russia to transport astronauts to the ISS on Soyuz spacecraft kind of move this whole commercial crew thing forward? Well, there had to be a way to come and get U.S. access to the station. Um, I, I think when you take that and you say, okay, that's an ingredient, that's, um, that's a piece of the puzzle. But there was other context too, which is um, it might be forgotten at one time we thought Orion might be taking crew to the station. Mm -hmm. And it's also forgotten, um, I've written about this, that uh, at one time we thought the station would actually be deorbited, um, not to, Long after it was finished, um, there were dates floated that would have had a space station after so many years constructing it, and at such great cost. And with the last flights of the shuttle uh, dedicated to it, that um, but there was a plan out there. It's a, it, it, there's a I call it a brief flirtation that said the station would have been deorbited, I, I believe, around 2015 or 16. Mm -hmm. um, this didn't last too long. By the time you realize the first spacecraft wouldn't be ready, in this case back then, Orion, uh, then you start to have this pressure, I believe. And I think that contributed to the, the sea change that said, we must try something new or we will not have any access to the station. And, and so that, that sea change and, and the, the great team that went in and did that, uh, if, you, if you explore what happened there, um, there were a lot of pressures to, to not only get the job done, but um, that gave you the latitude to do it differently. And the moment that Dragon Cargo docked with the ISS was a, mm -hmm. a historically significant moment. It was privately owned. It had been done for a fraction of what anybody could have expected. Uh, and, and it would lead to US commercial crew again. And now of course, there's talk of 
turning the station over into a commercial enterprise. Um, is that another brief flirtation or do you feel like that's going to actually be the end result for the station? I, I hope not. Um, so, so far it's not a well-funded effort, but it does appear to be well thought out. If you, if you go see what NASA has put out there for uh, the evolution from ISS to a private station when they were again, following the same model NASA, NASA doesn't own the hotel in this case, but it would rent a room. In this case, uh, the, the, it would have power. It would have, of course, life support. It would have space and it would have time on that private station. Um, that's a, uh, an analogous, uh, an analog to the, the notion of commercial crew or commercial cargo. We don't own the ride anymore, but we do get the service. We do get the ride. The ship is not ours. It's not like the shuttle. The shuttle is government property. Right. It's a distinction I think people often lose. Um, the Dragon, the Cygnus, uh, Antares are not government property. They are never handed over to the government. Right. Now you've written about cost plus versus commercial contracts. Now, which of those is better and which do you see as being the future? Well, the future is, uh, the temptation is to say the future is commercial and leave it at that, a nice, nice neat blur, but I don't think it's that simple. Um, the future I would say is in more commercial and knowing where cost plus really applies. Uh, cost Plus was originally a, an R&D acquisition mechanism. When you're not even sure how to get from A to Z, uh, you can go Cost Plus. You say, well, I'll try this. I'll pay by the hour. Um, it's sort of like, I'm not, I'm not really sure how long it'll take to clear this piece of land. I'll, I'll get a crew out here by the day. Mm -hmm. And then I'll see how it goes and whether or not I go this way or I zig or I zag. And you need some latitude. So there's a, there's a place for cost plus. So where I think cost plus has um, got lost over the years is it everybody thought everything was cost plus. Mm -hmm. When it had its uh, purpose, when you have a lot of uncertainty, a lot of um, uh, a lack of definition, even on what you want. But when you know what you want, and when the technology is demonstrably there and you have a very good idea of what you can get it for, then it, it's really not appropriate. You, you want more commercial, more partnering. Now, you write that many of the old ideas back in the early days of space, like uh, orbital refueling, they're suddenly new again. Why is that? Why are those ideas coming back? Uh, probably... Uh, Physics. Um, <laughs> it's like that saying, uh, you get to low Earth orbit, you're halfway to anywhere in the solar system, right? So, but we often seem to get there without a full tank. So you would, you would think, okay, um, what, is it, what is it exactly we're getting up into orbit? Well, it's mostly propellant. Right. And that, that's, our, that's, that's a big amount of the mass, but the propellant is only a means to an end. We want, we want to be out there and explore. We want our instruments to get to a certain location. We want science at that location. Uh, we want that drill on that planet. Mm -hmm. And we want that shovel at that planet. We, we may want it back uh, with a sample. Um, the propellant is just a means to an end, and yet it's, it's most of what we have to put up in orbit. Um, so we get, we get to orbit and we usually, um, you know, we've just started our trip and we're already working off half a tank or less. Um, even in Apollo, that, that Saturn S4B, right. which actually was the third stage, but they kept the, the naming for four as if it was the fourth uh, from an earlier design. So, so they, they get to orbit and it's already, um, used up part of its propellant. If, if you could have refilled that stage, uh, it would have had significantly more oomph, significantly more payload potential, right? Uh, now imagine you, you have other limitations. Um, the stage doesn't weigh much when it's empty mm -hmm. or nearly empty. Uh, you, you could put a lander on a nearly empty stage and launch uh, a deep space mission um, knowing that you're later going to fill that stage, but you could launch the empty stage and a full lander, a gassed up lander, 
uh, on, say, a Falcon Heavy right. without a need to develop a new, heavier launch capability. Um, now, of course, we can't say that without mentioning Starship. Uh, right. So, but, but again, all things being equal, imagine then you could refuel, and even Starship realizes that they're going to refuel. They can't get to the next step without refueling that Starship, which is the the upper stage of their Starship system, right? We are talking with Edgar Zapata on the Xterra podcast. Edgar is a retired NASA engineer who now writes a blog called ZapataTalksNASA.com. Um, let's keep on that uh, subject of the propellant a little bit and tell me what you think about some of these new ideas for different um, types of engines. We hear a lot about uh, nuclear power for spacecraft, the plasma thrusters, those kinds of things. Is that going to be kind of a game changer in once we reach orbit, getting to where we want to go? Oh, there's some phenomenal ideas out there for engines. If anything, we um, we don't we we need to figure out how to get more of them across the finish line to hardware. Um, nuclear, of course, has its uh, issues. Um, you, you've got a lot to overcome about people's concerns about uh, any nuclear material uh, in space. Um, NASA does does use um, nuclear systems or uh, RTGs for power sources, um, but even even those attract that kind of attention, that kind of risk aversion. Uh, we have to figure out a way to, to get past that to have the confidence, and then get that confidence to the to the people who make these decisions and to stakeholders, which is the public. Um, otherwise, uh, nuclear is going to get stuck in that um, constantly convincing phase instead of the doing phase. Mm -hmm. uh, plasma. Um, I mean, ISP is is everything. We uh, in in rocket speak. Um, we we need to go to the next level. We need to figure out how to hurl that mass even faster out the back so the ship can go faster. Uh, shorten trip times to Mars, for example, making it safer for the crew. Um, and of course, where do you want to go? Um, nothing like some uh, thousands of seconds or tens of thousands of seconds of, um, of push. Um, so, and, and that's just once you're in orbit. Right. Um, there's so much to do with engines to get to orbit as well. Uh, Air breathing engines, hypersonics, have fallen into a um, have fallen into a period of of malaise. It could be said, um, but that may not last very long. There's a lot of interest there. Uh, that used to be called the National Aerospace Plane, the Orient Express, right? So air breathing. Uh, but if you want to take off from an airport one day and and Granny wants to go to the station to visit her nephew, that that may be a very good way for her to do it. It'll look like an airplane and you you won't be doing that vertical takeoff one day perhaps uh, and this is all about uh which way technology goes you never you never quite know um anything anybody might do to say or speculate about technology sort of like uh, so are the blimps gonna win or is this little steel plane gonna win or aluminum plane i should say um uh, there, there would have been a time you would have had a uh a uh, very um, vociferous debate about that. It's, you know, it's got to be the blimps. Look at the luxury with which we travel there, right? So, um, and then along comes this DC three. It's uh, uh, so so. Where we're, we're we may be in that phase. We're trying to see which way technology goes, um, and we will probably be wrong, but we got to <laughs> keep going. That's the point. In a recent blog post, you wrote, "It's a system." What's that about? Ah, it's a system. Yeah, that was. Um, I I had I, I surprisingly I, I tend to write these blog entries um, a little late in the week. I, I toss around some thoughts. Um, write writers do this thing called word association, which you, you're you're you write. You know you know what that is. A little exercise, but I, I think I, I do something akin to like idea association. And I, I of course here in Orlando we were you know on the verge of getting a boil water notice, and then I thought, what's that about? It's it's a lack of liquid oxygen for the for the city to uh, purify the water supply. Uh, why is that? Well, because they're prioritizing 
liquid oxygen to the hospitals. We've got one right up the street here. They have a little uh, storage uh, doer in the back. You can see it. Uh, yeah, the cyclone fence, very nice, and all the valves and gadgets. And and then I, I, I was on the liquid oxygen system for some years for the space shuttle. So that's mm -hmm. the big storage sphere, all the cross-country line, everything in the mobile launcher. And then we're seeing launches held up possibly. And I thought, wow, all of this is connected. This is all connected. And it, it reminded me of um, so many things that we also got to that point when we were working in advanced projects. And we, we like to break things up into little pieces, right? So you could say, well, um, Susan, you take care of, you, you're in charge of this. And you've got the thermal protection system. And, uh, and Bob, you, you're working structures and you've got to get that, uh, that analysis. And, and this person over here and, and that person, and we break up the problem into all these little pieces because it's so much more manageable. But there were times we just couldn't do that. It was too connected. You had to throw them all together and they're in the same team. And so that was uh, what I was thinking of when I wrote It's a System that um, we, we live in such an interconnected world nowadays. It's not always possible to say, just break it up into little pieces and isolate them. They're, they can't be isolated. Just like the liquid oxygen can't be an isolated problem for a hospital. You wrote an op-ed for us at Xterra and you talk about the public-private partnerships that are emerging between NASA and private industry. So give us some of that history and tell us where those partnerships may lead. Oh, there's um, a lot going on there, I'd say in the, uh, in the birthing phase. Um, I'm working on a paper on this actually to tabulate all these. Um, there's even an RFI out there, request for information from NASA. You know, give us your, give us your thoughts, your ideas about uh, spacesuits as a service. Uh, so again, it would be, um, you know, rent a spacesuit um, mm -hmm. versus I will go build it or I will go purchase it after it's been built to my specifications and and it is government property, right? Um, so even there. Uh, in spacesuits, we're seeing that, but uh, we're seeing already that if uh, if we have a gateway, we're going to follow the, the model of a commercial purchase of getting cargo to the gateway that was awarded already. So you can you can keep seeing all this as sort of new territory, new programs, right? There are always new programs, um, and many of them, I'd say most right now, are going down this path that that started with getting. Uh, cargo to the station on a commercial basis. Um, you could see even the power and propulsion element of the gateway is, a, is being uh, acquired or purchased as, as the government would do, right? Uh, as a commercial item. It will be owned by the company for a year. Uh, NASA may or may not decide to buy it. Uh, that, that one's that one's a pretty interesting one. As you start to think analogies, it's sort of like the lease to buy. Mm -hmm. um, you lease the car, maybe you decided, I really like this car, I'm going to buy it, right? So um, this is all very novel. Uh, NASA would typically just say, hey, we're going to do a competition and there'll be a, a really big award and that's it, it's over. We've decided and it'll be handed all to the government, it's government property. So all these other different ways of acquiring things actually are ways in which the government is in a very different way relating to the private sector. If you could change one thing about the way the U.S. government approaches space, what would that be? Ah, yes. <laughs> no, I, I could go on that one forever, uh, but... <laughs> but we don't have forever, I, unfortunately. I, I, think, I think context is very important. And unfortunately, we... we we're not doing perhaps as much long-term planning, and there, there are reasons for this, as, as we might have once. Um, I, I, we used to call these um, sand charts in NASA. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of draw it and you say, you know, you, you put a man on the moon over here in a certain year, and then you work backwards, right? So you say, here's a, here's a you know, she, she is stepping out of the spaceship on the moon. And that is 20, and you put a year to it, right? And 
So you, you work backwards from that and you say, well, I, I must have a lander. I must have a, it may be nice to have a rover. Um, I must have spacesuits right. <laughs> that are for a planetary surface. So you, you start to say, well, I must have finished those spacesuits um, some years before that. So you, you mark that. You work your way back to today, right? And that, that would be long-term planning. Um, and I think that 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 would be something I would I would try to really emphasize if I could change one thing is to try to go back to that and um, think through all those scenarios. And unfortunately, I think that scenarios um, don't always give us the answers we want. And so then, they, you know, we may not go do them as as we should. Edgar, finally, look out kind of over the next 10 to 15 years and tell me where you think space commerce will be and what's coming down the road? Ooh, that's, that's a wide open question. Um, the, uh, <laughs> right, right now, I, I, when I think of space commerce, I, I, I start to think about things like Starlink, right? So um, new markets, things, we, things that were not being launched before. Uh, so if you, if you believe that uh, launch costs can drop beyond just SpaceX dropping, but other providers, um, uh, Rocket Lab or or Virgin or on the small launch side or or Firefly once they they get back on their feet right mm -hmm. then um, then you start to see prices drop so uh, the idea is that if it if it drops something eventually someone has an idea that they would not have launched at the higher price and that I think is where uh, there's a feedback mechanism that that virtuous cycle. Uh, between supply of launch and demand, which is a payload. So I think about Starlink also going back to that, which is uh, Musk decided, oh, I'll be both. Um, mm -hmm. And that is a very, that's very key. Uh, it's, not, it's not enough to get the price of something down. There has to be a reason to exercise that, that new capability. And that raises kind of an interesting question because when you talk about SpaceX and they are developing a complete system, when you talk about it's a system, but they have the launch vehicle, it's, it's reusable, um, they're putting up the satellites, they, it's sort of like a, a one-stop shop. Yeah. Will there be more of those or is, is Elon Musk uh, an anomaly in space commerce? I, I'd go so far as to say that I... I may hope it's an anomaly in a, in a very healthy market. Um, there should be more than just one place to go to get the service you want. Competition is good. Um, it gives you options. It keeps everybody on their feet. Uh, keeps everybody straight to, to know that uh, I better do good because my customer can go somewhere else. So I, I, I think it's fantastic right now. Um, in the long term, though, a, a healthy market has a lot of suppliers and a lot of uh, customers, a lot of demand, and it has a lot of new demand. Uh, and then that's a healthy market. Uh, and it's not just about growth, but also about the complexity of that market, I believe. Um, it can't just be that, you know, uh, like many markets, they settle into one major and one minor and everybody else. A really healthy market has a lot more than that. Uh, otherwise, you, you can quickly, again, have climbed up a curve and, and you can stagnate. And we'll, we'll need to go beyond rocket one day. We'll need to go beyond calm as a major market and beyond imaging as a major market. Edgar, we are out of time. Thank you so much for taking some time out to join us on the Xterra podcast. Thank you, Tom. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Xterra podcast. Find us on the web at xterrajsc.com. And be sure to connect with us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter at xterrajsc. Until next time, I'm Tom Patton. Thanks for listening.